And right now we're really sitting in the miracle that is a church plant, particularly a church plant in Seattle, Washington. We're literally beating the odds, not because of us, but because of God's grace. And if you had asked me five years ago if we would be sitting here today, honestly, I would have, I would have looked you in the eye and I would have said, I don't know. I really don't know. And so today is faith confirmed. And when you walk by faith, when you sacrifice by faith, when you invest by faith, it's never easy. It's hard, but it's faith, which is trusting in the good plans and the unfailing promises of God, no matter what his plans may be. And um, I say that, uh, but I don't want to misrepresent that, because even if we weren't sitting here today, even if had got, God had said, you know what, Sedaris is only going to go for three years or two years or one year, uh, our faith would still be confirmed. Because even in the hardness of that moment to have to say goodbye, God would be with us. And our faith would be confirmed that no matter what his plans are for us, he never forsakes us. He never leaves us. And so today faith is confirmed in this way, that we sit here in this miracle, this miracle of trusting that God was leading us, that, that he was holding us, and then just being thankful that we got to watch what he did and what he continues to do. We're still a growing uh, young church, and, and uh, we're so glad if you're new with us. We'd love for you to partner with us in faith and move this forward for the next five years. And the main thing that we do, which is what I'm about to do, we've been doing it for five years, is we teach the Word of God. We teach the Word of God. This is what God has asked us to do when we meet together, particularly on Sunday mornings, but every time we meet, to sit under the taught Word of God, to receive it, and that's our plan for the next five years. So if you were hoping there'd be a new plan, <laughs> there's no plan, there's no other plan. This is the plan, that we sit and press into the Word of God. Today is no exception to that. We are going to teach the heaven right out of this Bible. We're going to thump it, <laughs> but we're hoping to thump truly what heaven is, what the kingdom of God is. I always wanted to call myself a Bible thumper, so that, I, I figured out a way to say it. We're going to teach the heaven right out of this Bible. That's our hope today, and we're going to do it by looking at a very frustrating passage. It's going to frustrate you because it's going to ask you to willfully submit to your governing officials. You say, like, why'd you pick this one? I didn't pick it. We literally just teach through books of the Bible. That's what we do here. And it landed on this moment that we come to this frustrating passage that's going to ask us to willfully submit to the governing officials, the civil authorities over us, and we're also going to look at the passage that comes right after it, which is servants or slaves submitting to their masters. Whew. But you know what? We're going to beat the heaven right out of this Bible, and you're going to see why. This, too, is a great text to look at on an anniversary celebration. Why, Dave? Why? Dave, audible. <laughs> Why not skip? These are politically charged moments in, in American history. Why? Why not contextualize these passages away? Maybe just say Peter, uh, we're, we're in the book of 1 Peter. Peter's talking to, to A.D. 60 Christians living in the Roman Empire. He's not talking to us today. These urgings to them are not pressing on us, not in 21st century democracy. Why, why would we do this? Well, the answer is faith. The answer is faith. Because if I don't like something that the Bible says, doesn't mean that I suspend my original plan, which is to walk by faith, trusting in the revealed words of God, wherever they may lead. I can't abandon that plan. It's the plan that's gotten us here. It's the plan for the rest of our lives, that we walk by faith, trusting in the very words that come out of our Father's mouth. Through the prophets and the apostles and the written word inspired by the Spirit of God. The reason why I'm preaching this passage today is because of faith. I don't get to just trust God in, in something that I agree with, I trust him in everything. If I only trust God in the things I agree with and then trust myself in the things I don't agree with, guess what I'm actually doing? I'm only trusting in myself. 
And that's not, that's not the faith that we teach and preach and urge each other to in this church. And my hope is that when we trust and we lean in and we actually try to hear, we ask the Spirit of God to give us big ears to understand what he's saying, that we might actually see that Peter's exhortation, that his urging to honor and respect and submit in certain ways to the governing authorities in your life, that in fact, we will see that this is a vehicle that God has chosen to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world and to our city. These aren't just unfortunate passages that we have in our Bible. These are actually amazing gospel proclamations. So here's the big idea. Voluntary yielding is part of gospel proclamation in a temporary world. Voluntary yielding is part of gospel proclamation in a temporary world. Now, I know that's a loaded statement, so let's see if we can unpack this. Why would Peter, and if you don't know anything about Peter, he's the disciple that when Jesus was arrested, the very first thing he did was pulled out his sword and chopped off a Roman officer's ear. And he's the one that's about to tell us to choose to submit. Why would he say it? So I hope by the end you'll see why this is not actually an un-American thing to do. This is, this is a very democratic way of leaning in to the things that God puts in your life. So if you have a Bible, would you open it? If you don't, grab one. There's some on the ends of your row. Ask somebody to pass it down to you. We're in the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. We've been walking through this over several weeks. If you wanted to catch up because... Uh, Letters like this were written to be read all at once, and we kind of chop them up and try to explain them just because there's such a context gap, and we need to understand the context and try to explain it better. So 1 Peter chapter 2, it's near the end of your Bible. You can use the table of contents. You can Google 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. And um, listen, I thought about this. I've been thinking about this for five years. Dave... Just preach, preach a simple, clear, you know, easy to follow sermon. Just give the people after five years, give them a break. And just like he does every week, he says, Dave, that, and I think it's him, he says, Dave, they don't need that. Give them some real meat. Give them something that will build them up. Give them something that will actually explain. They don't need platitudes. They need deep understanding of the Word of God. And so we're going deep today, and I apologize that for five years I've been saying no to the short sermon and and yes to the long, deep sermon, but we're doing it again. It's taken us this far. And pray that God would give you the patience and the ears to sit and hear, because if you can stick with me to the end of this, I think it's going to make sense of everything. Um, Not everything, but a lot of things that have been you've been wrestling with about how do you live in this world that requires these kinds of interpersonal and government relations. Okay, so just we're going to do it. So are we there yet? That was that was me allowing you to get to First Peter chapter two. So let's read the whole passage. Actually, we're just going to read the first two. Let's just do that. Let's read the verse two verses. I'll explain it and then we'll keep moving. So First Peter chapter two, verse eleven says this: Beloved, I urge you. As sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Okay, here is the context for the rest of what he's going to say over the next two chapters. So we had to look at it again. And, and, and what we can see in this first word, beloved, if you remember how to read your Bible, this is like, I'm about to start a new idea. So it's in the vocative tense, and he's, he's like, listen, okay, I've just said something that says, beloved, now pay attention. I'm going to explain something to you. And, and this is why that word is so important to start with, okay? He is speaking now to agapeton. That's the Greek word, agapeton. Agape being the way God loves us. So he's saying, for those of you whom God loves, God's loved ones. Now, why is this important? He's speaking only to the community of Christ. So what he's about to say, he's not saying this applies to everyone. 
He's saying this applies to Christians. So if you're not yet a Christian in the room, we're so glad that you're here. One of the reasons we exist as a community is to help you consider Jesus. So these words might be really challenging to you, and they're probably going to make no sense to you until you understand who God is and what he's done for you in Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing you need to consider. Is Jesus Christ the Son of God, and is the gospel true that God sent the Son into the world to reconcile the world back to him? If you don't understand that, most of this is not going to make any sense to you. So just understand that. He's talking to the agapeton, those who know that God loves them and knows that God has sent the Son to them. And we'll explain why that's so important later. I just want to set that up um, because these are foreign words to people not agapeton, okay? So Peter has just said, and if you haven't listened to Ryan's sermon from last week, fabulous sermon, go listen to that online. Uh, Ryan talked about the passage just before this where he talks about we are a holy nation set apart by God, a royal priesthood. We are living stones connected together in the spirit and we're building a spiritual temple for God. That's what the church is. It's this glorious future that we await, that we're promised when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom in full. That's what was talked in chapter one. So all of those things are in view here. And then he says, now you beloved ones, I'm going to tell you this is how you need to live. If you are part of this beloved of Christ, Peter is reminding you as well that you are, look at verse 11, sojourners and exiles. Let me remind you, in the very first sermon we talked about this. This is how the book starts. He says, hey, elect exiles. Why is this so important? Well, he's reminding them that although he's about to say things about how they live in this world, in this country, in this place and time with these governors and these rulers, he's saying, remember, this isn't your ultimate home. This isn't your true citizenship. You haven't given up the citizenship in heaven to be a Roman citizen. So he's saying, remember that first and foremost, God and his kingdom is your true home. You are here in this time resident aliens. This reality and that's what the word sojourner means, right? Coming for a time. You're passing through this world. This world is not your final destination. You're sojourners. And you will feel at times like you are an immigrant in the land. You will feel as though this culture is not quite your culture. He's just reminding you of that. Because he's going to tell you, even though that's true, how should you act while you live here? So here it goes. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to do two things. One is what not to do. So don't do this and do do this. Okay? So don't do this and do do this. Here's what he says. To abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. So that's what you're not to do. Don't do that. Don't Embrace fully the desires and passions of the flesh. And the flesh is always connected to those carnal parts of you, those appetites that we all have that move us to do things that are contrary to the will of God. So, so fight against those passions, he's saying. They wage war in your soul. Abstain from them. Don't do those things. But it's not just about not doing certain things. It's also about doing certain things. So, verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Keep it honorable. What's that mean? Well, we'd looked at conduct a couple weeks ago. You see it multiple times, three times in chapter 1. He's talking about be holy as God is holy. Do the things that God would do. So, the way, conduct being your way of life. Let your way of life be honorable. What does he say? Among the Gentiles. And what is he talking about Gentiles? Well, he's speaking to non-Jewish people, but now he's applying Gentile to mean all those people that aren't part of the people of God, because he said just before this that everyone who's connected to Jesus is now the new Israel, a part of the people of God. So he's saying for anyone that's not yet part of the people of God, the Gentiles, so to speak, or the pagans, uh, those secular people, Make sure that when they watch your way of life, they see it as honorable. Honorable is this Greek word, uh, kalos, which could mean good, beautiful, noble, fair, handsome, virtuous. So when people look at your life, those people that aren't yet part of uh, the people of God, that they might say, wow, that is an, they are honorable people. They are honorable people. Often this word kalos 
if you see it time and time again in the New Testament, it's often connected to good fruit. Good fruit. So let your life bear good fruit. Attractive fruit. Shiny red apples, so to speak. So here's Peter's idea. When God's people produce good fruit, and it stands next to other fruit in the city, the deeds and the actions and the honorable living of God's people might be attractive to the eye of every citizen, whether they are Christian or non-Christian. Then, he says, it will be very hard for them to speak evil of you. Look at what he says. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So, this was a really serious issue in Peter's day. In fact, uh, historians, non-Christian historians, have uh, pointed this out, that many citizens who were not followers of Jesus would actually accuse Christians of serious crimes. Two in particular, incest and cannibalism. You say, what? what? What were these Christians up to? Now, why would they do that? Well, they'd heard about the Christian communities. They thought they knew what they were teaching and what they were doing. And think about incest. They were calling each other brother and sister. Everyone in the Christian family is a brother and a sister. Guess who's also my sister? My wife, Allie. And I married her. So you see the confusion. They thought, I thought that person was your sister, your brother. And the rumor mill starts. And these reputations start to rise up. And people think they understand Christianity and think they're just intermarrying with their brothers and sisters. They don't understand the fuller reality. What about cannibalism? Well, each and every week we come to this table, and we'll do it again today. This is called the Lord's Supper or communion. And what do we do? We partake and we eat the body and the blood of Jesus. Now imagine that rumor circulating in the rumor mill of these Roman cities. Every time they get together, they eat the body and drink the blood of the one they worship. So it could be confusing, and you could see how people would begin to speak evil against God's people. Now, some of this was happening out of honest ignorance. They didn't know what actually was going on. And some of this was happening as people who were against the Christians would stir up false accusations. They'd fan into flame these rumors of incest and cannibalism. And Peter's going to say right here, there's there's two potential ways to combat that. The first way is that we can clarify what these practices mean. We can invite people to come and see that this isn't the real body and the real blood of Jesus. These are symbols, spiritual symbols of what Jesus has done. And he gave on the cross his body and his blood. So we remember that. It's not real body. It's not real blood. We're not cannibals. So we can invite them in and we can clarify and we can teach people about Christianity. But what about those people that won't touch Christianity with a 10-foot pole? They refuse to come into a place of worship. They refuse to hear anything that you have to say about this Jesus. Peter says here, for many people, the best way to clarify for them what Christians are like is to combat these false accusations by the lives that you live. That these lives are a life of such utter goodness and beauty and honor that it's really hard for these other people who are really trying to figure out what Christianity is to believe the lie. To believe that those people are incestual and cannibals, it's really hard. He's a really good worker. I have lunch with him all the time. He's actually quite kind. He always asks me about my children. Should I be worried about him? (laughs) No. Because in every aspect of your life, you're living in such an honorable way that the false rumors begin to seem silly. Do you think there's any false rumors about Christians in our society? Bigots, hatred, racist. Now, I'm not saying that some people that claim to be Christians aren't those things. But we can't change those people that are claiming to be followers of Jesus and acting in these unhonorable ways. All we can do is clearly show them that we are a follower of Jesus and we live lives that are honorable and good 
We are not bigoted. We are not haters of anyone. And actually, we are lovers of all people at every socioeconomic class, every race, that we are actually living stones that come together in really unique, glorifying ways. People can look and they can see. Our job is to make it hard to believe the accusations by the way that we live. Look, jump down with me to verse 15. Peter reinforces this idea in verse 15. He says this, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. In addition to those who are honestly confused about Christianity, those are those, there, there are those who are willfully ignorant, they don't want clarification, or even those that are honestly combative. Honestly combative. They might even lie on purpose. <gasps> what? People would lie about Christians on purpose? Yeah. Peter says it's happening here. Your good will put them to silence. The fools will be silenced by your good. So let me give you an illustration. I want you to picture in your mind two apple trees. Side by side, two apple trees. One apple tree is a Christian tree full of kalos fruit. And I might even add that many of the rotting branches have been pruned away. The other tree is the tree of a person who is purposefully spreading false rumors about Christianity or those who publicize, let's say, only the negative stories that they hear of so-called Christians. Now, picture just an average, common, unbiased third-party observer examining both trees, looking at them, seeing one teeming with fruit, the fruit of truthfulness and good deeds and model, model citizenship and generosity and philanthropy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the other tree is primarily teeming with gossip, empty talk, the promotion of false rumors, perhaps hyperbole, or even outright lies and deception that come to light. What will the reasonable observer deduce about which tree they want to be associated with? That's what Peter's saying. He's saying, let it become so obvious that this tree, your tree, is full of life and more desirable and more beautiful and more wise than the tree of those foolish, blind hypocrites. So that when the unbiased observer is choosing who to listen to, who to follow, who to be in relationship with, who to have over for dinner, that if they're honest, of course they're going to want to be around wisdom, and truth, and beauty, and they might even have an open ear to hear what is it that makes you this way. Maybe, maybe not. And that's what most people really want, at least people without a vendetta. They are searching deep down for what is true and good and beautiful. And so when the questions circulate in a society, Peter says, about who is the real danger to society, right? Have you heard those rumors? Who is the danger in society? Whose seeds should we be worried about spoiling the whole orchard? Let your life be such that it's increasingly hard to believe the lie that it's the Christian seed or the Christian trees that are the cause of all this rot. And perhaps they begin to hear the cackle of the fools and it's silenced. That's what Peter's saying. That is our primary way in which we begin to lift up the name of Jesus in our city by living honorable lives. And look at verse 12. He says this. Now, what actually might happen is they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Who is he talking about? He's talking about that third-party observer. That because of your good life, the day of visitation here, I don't believe, is looking to the end of time when Jesus returns, though in that day, your good deeds will be shown for what they are. I think he's talking about when God sends his spirit to proclaim the name of Jesus and the, good, the gospel good news in the world right now, when God visits people with that message, people's ears will be open in a pagan society 
to really consider the gospel of Jesus Christ because they've seen your good deeds and your honorable living. And they will give it a fair shake. And some will even hear it and glorify God. All because of how you've lived. This is amazing. You might say it like this. Your beautiful living is the ground preparation work for the miracle of grace. It doesn't change anybody. They're not born again by your good deeds, but it prepares the ground that the seed, when it falls, might fall on good soil. So what is that beautiful living? In all the social relationships that we find ourselves, Peter is going to highlight three major social relationships that many, many people have to give us principles that then we can extrapolate to any social situation that life affords. Now, you'll look at this and you'll say he only gives three, whereas other apostles who have written other letters to the churches that we have recorded here in our Bible give us more. Um, So why does Peter leave some out? For instance, he doesn't talk about uh, children and their parents here. Why not? Does Peter not think that God has anything to say about children obeying their parents or following the lead of their parents? Of course not. But his choice is reflecting what he's actually wanting to talk about. That he's highlighting these relationships in part because they're so challenging when you become a Christian. When you understand that you are truly royal, a son or a daughter of God, and that you have a future inheritance planned for you. These relationships become very, very difficult. And so he's highlighting them to show us some greater purpose for why we live in these particularly honorable ways. So Peter's going to talk to us about every, uh, how every Christian should live in regard to the civil government. Then he's going to talk to us about how every Christian servant should live and work in regard to their master. And then he's going to talk to us about how Christian wives should live in relation to their husbands and then how Christian husbands should live in relation to their wives. We're going to try to tackle the first two this week uh, because next week we have a great uh, honor and privilege to have uh, one of our ministry partners, her name's Kathy Geisk, come and talk to us about Christian marriage. Uh, She has a a mission organization that she runs called uh, Middle East Partners that works in the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, uh, working with refugees, and we support her as a church, and uh, we've come to know her and know that she's full of wisdom. She has over 30 years of marriage experience, and so we said, hey, please come. Would you come and teach us um, how you understand these passages in 1 Peter 3? So be looking forward to that. Come next week. Um, and hear what Kathy has to say to us about Christian marriage. But they're all related. They're all, they're all related to a primary principle that we'll talk about today. So let's get into it. Citizens and government. Let's look at how we should live, how the world will see our, li- our living in this way as honorable. Peter's going to tell us. So let's read verse 13 to 17. He says this, Be subject... For the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by the emperor to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. That's fellow Christians. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now, what's going on? <laughs> How, wait, wait, what? You told me to live an honorable life, and now you're telling me I got to do whatever the emperor tells me to do? Be subject? What? I'm out. <laughs> well, to understand what he's saying, we got to understand this word, be subject. It's the Greek word, hypotasso, um, and, and it means to come underneath and to subordinate yourself, to attach yourself, to come under the authority of another. And what's really important about this word, and you're going to see this word come up again and again and again in Peter. To understand, uh, every time it comes up, it's in the passive tense of the verb. And we don't see that in the English. But really what it's saying is, it's not saying that the emperor gets to subject you, that would be the active voice, it's saying you get to subject yourself to the civil authorities, to every human institution. If you read that in the Greek, it would say to every institution ordained by God of men, is what the Greek actually says. So what he's saying is, these human institutions are actually ordained by God, 
And that is why you should choose to freely come underneath whatever civil authority in the land that you live. Be model citizens. Now, the passive tense is so important here. Why? Who has the power? It is he or she who is subjecting themselves. So you have the power, not the government. Do you see that? We, we read this now, and it seems, obviously, this was so <laughs> subvertive, revolutionary. He's using the passive tense, the emperor might have thought when he, you know, they read this. What? You, they get to choose if they're going to submit to me or not? But that's what Peter's saying. So even though he's saying, don't overthrow the government, but come underneath, be a model citizen, follow the laws of the land, because those laws are there if it's a good government to protect you, and we'll talk about that in just a sec, um, come underneath it, because this isn't your home. This world isn't your kingdom. So you don't need to convert the kingdom to Christianity. You just need to show the goodness and glory of God by the way you live within this current kingdom. So come underneath it. And then the passive tense, it's like, um, here's the, a good way to think about it, because this will be important every time we talk about this, what we talk about with slaves and masters next. It's like a, a running back in football. Have you ever seen a play, if you watch football, or like rugby, where one person, only one person has the ball, and, and they're, say they're trying to get a first down or they're trying to score a touchdown, and they're kind of stopped by the defense. And then the giant offensive linemen are quite bigger and stronger and really better looking. I, I say that because my son Owen's giant and he's probably going to be an offensive lineman. So <laughs> always more good looking. And, and they come up and they just begin to push. They put all of their weight behind the running back to push him into the end zone or push him to the first down. Have you seen this? Sorry if you're not a football fan. But they're freely choosing. They don't have to. They've done their job already, but they're choosing to put their weight behind the running back, who will eventually get what? The glory, if they get the touchdown. The offensive lineman doesn't come, take the ball out of the running back's hand, and fall into the end zone. It's a really good picture of what it means. I'm going to choose to put my weight behind that person who already has the power, Peter says, and try to make your nation, your empire, as, as good of a nation as it can be by working for the good of the country within the parameters and the laws. Even if, even if the emperor or the governors aren't the best. This is hard. You have a choice to make. And Peter reminds us that in verse 16. Look at this. Live as people who are free. You are free to not do that. You are free to work against the government, your civil authorities, your mayor, whoever it may be, you can do that. But he's saying, I don't think God wants us to be those kinds of people. Don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Man. But you don't understand, Dave, how much I abhor my current politicians. If you knew how much I abhorred them, you wouldn't be asking me to do that. Maybe we'll see later why that's not a very good excuse for promoting evil against your government. This is hard stuff. Is it evil? to disobey God, if he's ordained these particular civil governments and authorities, is it evil to disobey God and tear down what he's put in place? That's what you have to ask yourself. Peter's saying, don't let your freedom lead you into the bondage of sin, into the bondage of hate, into the bondage of murdering people in your heart or murdering them with your hand. Don't, don't give all that up the freedom that you found in Christ just because this is a really hard situation. This is so tough. Remember, this is the guy who was the fighter. This was the guy that was cutting off people's ears. Something's changed in his heart. Now, here, here's such an important thing to see. Verse 17. 
he says this. He gives us a great list, a great summary of how to do this. One, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, the brothers and sisters in Christ. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now, he uses honor twice, so he's clearly okay using the same word. He's not just trying to find synonyms. What does that mean? It means the way that we treat everyone and the way that we, that we treat the emperor is different than the way we treat our brothers and sisters and the way we interact with God. We honor Timeo, everyone, and we honor the emperor. He's a part of everyone. But we love agape as God has loved us, the brotherhood of Christ, the family of God, and we fear phobeo, God. What's that mean? It means we don't have to love the emperor and we don't have to fear the emperor. I hope that's good news. We simply have to honor and respect whom God has put into place and pray that they might do the work of goodness and beauty in our midst to punish evil and to do and praise good while honoring them. That's really helpful for me. At the end of the day, remember this. We fear God, and so God's law always, pardon my French, trumps man's law. Always. So if the emperor ever asks you to do something that God has forbid, you fear God, and you respectfully decline to the emperor. Really important. So what does this principle look like played out in 21st century democracy like ours? Three comments. I said like this, three comments. Comment number one, look at the qualifier in verse 14. Whether it be the emperor supreme or governors sent by the emperor to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good, you should subject yourself to them, freely choose to come underneath their leadership. But why this little qualifier? I think this is important. One is recognizing God has given us, by his common grace, civil authorities to suppress evil, sin, murder, right? To build up common goodness, roads, you know, sharing of wealth and distributing it as needed so that we can accomplish goals that we couldn't otherwise do. So God, in his infinite wisdom, is appointing us civil governments, even though they might be ungodly in many ways. But he's doing that to punish evil and to praise good so that civilizations couldn't, aren't as terrible as they possibly could be. So that's part of God's plan, part of his love for us. It's his common grace is what you could call it. All the while, while we wait for the true king, that's Jesus, to come back and to put it all into place as it should be. So here's how we could think about this little qualifier. In our searching out for rulers to vote for in our democracy, we should look for the ones who seem trustworthy when they promise us that they will suppress and punish evil and praise and do good. Now, most politicians are saying those things, but who can we trust? So we look for those people because that's who God wants us to look for, particularly in a democracy when we have a chance to put our vote behind somebody. Now, When they stop doing that or they fall flat on their promises, we should no longer vote for them. And we should no longer follow them if it leads us into sinful behavior. We should try to get them out of office at every level of government so that somebody who punishes evil and promotes and praises good can step into that office. Now, it's really hard to know when when somebody has moved beyond God's design here to punish evil and to praise good. Because I do think there's a moment, if that changes, where God is saying, I no longer have my hand on this person. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was wrestling with this very question from a Christian perspective during World War II in his home country of Germany. He was asking the question, how do I live out 1 Peter when the ruling authorities seem to be ungodly, to the extreme. And he, spoiler alert, he ended up leading an assassination plot against Hitler. So here was a Christian pastor leading a plot to murder somebody. See the tension, (laughs) okay? Now here's what I think he came to in his mind. 
he realized that God has appointed even ungodly people to lead civil governments to suppress evil and to promote good to some degree. And if you see them doing the opposite, promoting evil and punishing good, perhaps then you know this is not the person God has ordained to be there. I think that's the conclusion Bonhoeffer likely came to. And so he thought then now he has the biblical mandate to try to remove that which is doing evil to replace the government. So when does that, when do we get across that line? These are difficult questions. I think, to be honest, we haven't seen that in our country yet, and so we use the power of the vote, we use the power of protest, we use the power, powers that we have in our democracy to move towards governments that fulfill more of the punishing evil and doing good and promoting good through democratic processes. But this is hard. The second thing I'd like to say is that democracy is the best and most Christian form of government that the world has ever seen for a couple of reasons. So we should celebrate it, even though it's flawed and imperfect, we should celebrate it because democracy, uh, the theory at least, puts the power in the hands of the people to freely choose to come underneath to subject themselves to particular rulers, right? It's not freedom to be your own ruler. That's not democracy. Democracy is freedom to choose who you'll come under. You see how that's exactly what Peter's saying? That that's the way of God in the world? So it is actually the enactment of the passive verb for subject, whereas most government systems until American democracy worked the other way around, that somebody was given power and they subjected the people. They would like the people to maybe come underneath their leadership, but they ultimately actively subjected them. Democracy is different, particularly American democracy. And this is why we should celebrate the success of American democracy, because it proves the higher truth that Peter's pointing to here, that even though it's challenging, that if you choose to come underneath and rugby push forward as a people, you can accomplish through passive subjection, submitting yourself to authorities, you can accomplish things that otherwise cannot be accomplished. There is a weight and a pace and a movement that's happened in America that's unbelievable. Historically speaking, you're like, how did we do it? We did it through activating the passive voice of the word subject. Amazing. So finally... I'll say this, even though we subject ourselves, it requires our active participation in a 21st century democracy. Voting, protest, they're all a part of, I think, 1 Peter 2, because God has given us this particular constitutional framework to live in, so we must be active, we cannot be inactive. God's put us here to live in the democracy that we live in, so we must participate in it. We have choices to make including voting ourselves, being informed and honest and thoughtful. We must help to turn out the vote, helping others to consider the most important issues and parts of any election. That's part of our job as honorable people, is to activate this really great governmental system, though it's imperfect, to activate it for the suppression of evil and the praise of good. And this includes peaceful protest. When the trajectory of civil authorities and their decision-making leads us away from celebrating good and punish, punishing evil, we should protest. The constitutional framework allows us to do this. And Martin Luther King Jr., the reverend, I'll remind you, he truly silenced the fools when he led the most successful and profound protest that history has ever seen. And he did it from the firm, unshakable foundation of Scripture, did he not? He showed the world that law-abiding, honorable, respectful protest against evil and for good can look like this. And so he built for himself an apple tree of goodness that the rest of the world still looks to today and points to and we celebrate as a country, not because he was a perfect man, but because they looked at his good deeds and the way he subjected to the authorities and worked within the system to truly shift the hearts and the minds of, of leaders and politicians for the good of the whole. And so we must acknowledge that. 
that's an apple tree I'd like to follow. And I wish that the country and most people would look and read everything that he wrote and see how truly, how truly he loved and feared God and his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is what motivated him to live in the way he did. So we too, in the 21st century democracy, must be delegates of God's kingdom, living in this temporary kingdom. God is calling us to protest evil, promote good in a multitude of ways outlined in scripture, but not to take over secular government, not to turn this into God's kingdom. Only Jesus brings the kingdom with him. Though we fight as free people underneath the elected authority in law-abiding ways to move our country and our city and our state towards suppressing evil and promoting good. And that's all I have to say about that. (laughs) Though it's just the tip of the iceberg. But we have to move on. Yes, we do have to move on to servants and masters. Look at, read 18. Let's go quick. Servants. Be subject, same word, same tense, to your masters, passive tense, subject yourself to your masters with all respect. Again, not love, not fear, respect, not only to do, not only to the good and gentle masters, but also to the unjust masters. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you are good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Okay. Same principle. It's just zoomed in now. You're living in a household, which is a civil government and authority. Now he's zooming in. Living in a household of, say, the Aquilian household in a Greek-Roman city, okay? You are a servant in the household. That's actually servant. There's many... Uh, words for servant. It's talking particularly about a household servant. And he's saying, in this household, which is like the household of a government, in this household, come under, choose to freely come under, even though you are free, and in God's sight, you could leave, and you wouldn't be sinning against God to leave, because you are free. Choose, in this temporary moment, to stay there for some reason. And what is the reason? He says, because if you are beaten for doing good, something will happen. People will see something different in you. Now he's saying, if you get beaten for sinning, if you steal something from the master and he beats you, people will be like, I got what he deserved. But if you get beaten for doing good, people will wonder. And what is he saying? Now, who's he talking about? Who's good? Not the good of the servant. They're getting beaten. Whose good is it? Guess what? Most households had more than one servant. So guess what would happen? All the other servants would watch as this servant who followed Jesus was being beaten for doing good. And they would see two apple trees standing next, one with a whip, beating one who did and lived honorably. Guess what happens? Some might turn and glorify God. That's why you stay, even though you're free. Man, this is a whole can of worms. They're living in a society where these relationships just happen. How does this extrapolate to our society? Well, most of you aren't the CEOs of your company, so you're coming underneath the leadership of somebody else. Some CEOs are just, some aren't. Make sure you suffer for doing good. Make sure you work hard and honorably for your boss, no matter what. No matter if you get beaten for it, demoted for it, they take the credit for it because people are watching. And if you get beaten for doing good, you're, you're showing the world something. What are you showing them? Look at verse 21. For to this you have been called. <laughs> what? He's talking to the servants here, but he's also talking to us. He's also talking to any citizen of an empire. To this you have been called. By who? By God. By God. Look at verse 20. For what credit is it if you sin and are beaten for it? You have been called to this. Called to what? This very challenging relationship. This very challenging structure. This very challenging government system. This very challenging fill in the blank. God has called you to it. And what credit is it to you 
if you sin and are beaten for it. But there is credit in it if you do good and suffer for it. What credit? Not salvation credit. The only credit you need as a Christian is the credit that was purchased for you on the cross of Jesus Christ. Your credit. You need no more of it. It's credit amongst the people who watch you. Those other servants of the house. Those other citizens of your city. Those other people in your family. They will give you credit if you take on this calling, whatever it may be, and live it out in an honorable way. And the credit you will ultimately bring is not for yourself, but for God's glory. Because, because of what? Read the rest of this section. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you as an example so that you might follow in his steps. What were his steps? Verse 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued, entrusting himself to him, that's God the Father, who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that's the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. So this word, you see it all over the New Testament, hippotasso, subject to. You see children to parents, young Christian to old Christians, every Christian to governing authorities, wives and husbands, emperors to God, angels and all spiritual beings to Jesus, all men and women to God, all Christian brothers and sisters to one another, the church to Christ, Jesus the son to the father, Jesus the young tyke to his parents in Luke chapter 2. So everyone that has ever worn flesh is subjecting themselves to something. And why? Why is this the constant testimony of Scripture that this is the human experience? Because everyone knows what it's like. How hard it is. The pain that can be caused by being underneath the authority of another. And nobody understands it more than God's Son. Who did what? Who gave up his royalty in heaven with the Father, and chose to come and put on the limitations and subject himself to human flesh and subject himself to human parents and subject himself to Roman authorities and subject himself to Jewish authorities all the way he subjected himself willfully by his own power, by his own choice, until he subjected himself to a Roman cross to die. That's his story. And he did that for you. He subjected himself for you. Not for him. For you. And as he's breathing his last breath on the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't know who I am, truly. They don't know what power I possess. They don't know what you call me, God. And because he chose that, when he died, your sin was buried in Christ. And you get to rise with him to new life. And so for Peter, why this is so important for him is he's saying, everyone knows how hard it is to be subject to authority. But Christians are the only ones who do it willfully, with joy, with honor, without two-facedness, without gossip, without talking bad about their boss behind their back, without grumbling all the way, because they actually see it as an opportunity to reenact the Jesus story. They see it as a chance to actually show the world what God did for them. They get to show the world that, guess what? God calls me a royal son, a priest. I'm a part of his holy nation. I'm his child. But I will for a time 
come underneath your weak puppet leadership. (laughs) I get to freely choose to live a life lesser than what God has called me to because I get to reenact the Jesus story. I get to sacrifice and submit to a world who thinks they're smarter and more beautiful and more good than God because I care about them enough to live in their midst and be surrounded by them and interact with them so I might show them there's something more beautiful, more good. And it's actually the personal God of heaven and earth. So that they might consider this story that has led you to live in this way so that they might hear of this Jesus so that they might turn to God and ask for his mercy just like you did when you heard of what Jesus did for you so that they might ask and receive the gift of grace and forgiveness and life everlasting that came when you heard about how Jesus subjected himself for your sake so that they might be found to be people who freely choose to come underneath the authority of the one and only living God whom we're all created to be subjected to. But they'll do it by their own choice and receive the new life that comes from that. Voluntary yielding (laughs) is to be like Jesus and is a part of your gospel proclamation to his world. I want to read these verses again and then we're going to pray. Verse 21 through 25. Maybe they'll make more sense to you now. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Let's pray. Father God, the heartbeat of our church from day one has been that people in our city might honestly consider this Jesus who gave up his place and his power and his position and his comfort to come into this world and to save sinners like us. And our hope for the next five years is that more and more people might consider our lives not as stumbling blocks to their consideration of Jesus, but as signposts that point to the true beauty of the one that we worship. Make our lives, bring fruit from our lives so that people might consider your son. God, our hope in this city is that For all your sheep scattered, that they, no matter how far they are, might hear your voice and might stop straying and might come home and return to their only true shepherd and the overseer of their souls. God, I I don't know why you've asked us to get to be a part of this plan in big and small ways in people's lives, but please use us. Please use me. I am not my own, we are not our own, but belong in body and soul, in life and in death, to the faithful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.